Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. that my young life were a lasting dream, my spirit not awakening till the beam of an eternity should bring the morrow." Edgar Allan Poe In a dream, Joseph saw himself sleeping, his twelve-year-old body tucked in a thick comforter on top of his old hand-me-down mattress. Even as he stood by his bedside, looking at himself, he could feel the warmth of the comforter. Curious, he thought to himself. He decided to explore this dream. He looked out his window, the moon still bright, and with a bit of concentration, he passed through the window like a ghost in a movie, gently floating to the ground from his second floor room in the way gravity's laws hold no sway over a dreamer. He explored the empty streets as snow started to fall. With great leaps, he could almost fly floating as he ignored gravity and the rules of the wakening world. The streets were dark, and the only sound of an occasional car could be heard in the distance. Joseph did not feel the night chill he should have. After a little time of playing and exploring, he saw something. Down the darkly lit street was a figure, a silhouette of a child no older than him. The figure had no facial features and appeared to be a black mass only in the shape of a boy. It turned. Even without eyes, Joseph could tell it was staring at him. Unnerved by the figure, Joseph ran home, moving faster than his wakening legs would manage. He never looked back to see if he was followed. Stopping when he reached the front of his house, standing on the front steps, was his mother. The tall, blue-eyed woman was smoking a cigarette in her pajamas, breaking another promise to quit. As she dropped the ashes into the flower pot next to her, Joseph wanted to yell at her. However, he quickly found he had no voice. As he tried to gain his mother's attention, he found she did not notice him at all. She tossed the last of her cigarette into the flower pot before going back inside. Joseph followed inside as well and walking back to his room was the last thing he remembered before being awakened by the sun in his eyes. As he walked out the door the next morning, he nearly forgot about the dream. In the flower pot by the door, there was a cigarette butt. She really is smoking, he thought to himself with a sigh as he made his way to the bus stop. It wasn't until lunch that he noticed how tired he was unable to keep his eyes open any longer, he fell asleep right in the cafeteria. Once again, he dreamed. He saw himself face down in his chair and the spitballs on his back from the kids at the table behind him. He watched the room a bit before moving out of the cafeteria, unsure where to go. He moved to his next class. 
There he saw Miss Francis teaching the class on the schedule ahead of him. They looked to be taking a pop quiz. Joseph felt dread at the thought. Once again, none of the kids or the teacher noticed him as he moved between desks, looking over each of his peers' shoulders. Bored of school, he decided to move outside. He put his hands to the window, ready to flow it out like he had done before. However, he noticed a dark figure just below. It was the faceless child again, crawling up the wall as if it were the floor. It was on all fours now, looking even less human, with extended arms and fingers that ended in points like one large claw. Joseph almost fell out of his chair as the loud ringing noise of the bell went off. Once he stood up, he noticed the spitballs falling off his back. With a quick rub, he wiped the rest off angrily and moved on to the next period. There, Miss Francis announced a pop quiz. The quiz read the same as it did in the dream. Suddenly remembering the window, he ran over and looked down. Yet there was nothing there. The rest of the class stared at him, mumbling, thought I saw something. He sat back down and took the quiz. Joseph, however, could barely write. He was starting to understand his dreams were more tied to reality than he thought. Over the next few days, Joseph went to bed earlier and earlier, looking forward to his dreamlike playground. It was clear now that no one could see him in this state. He started with spying on his older sister as she spent time in her room, wakening and sneaking in the room later to confirm what he saw in his sleep. He did not see the dark figure for a few nights and slowly stopped thinking about it altogether, enjoying his newfound powers too much. However, each time he waked, the less sleep he felt like he had gotten. His mother noticed her sleepy child and decided to keep him home from school and fear of illness. Before today, most of his trips into the dream world had been at night, so Joseph did not put up a fuss when his mother put him back to bed, his body quickly dazed to sleep while his mind, his spirit-like form, awoke. He only took one glance at his sleeping body before running off to the school. This time, he was free with no time limit to spy on his peers. He moved faster than he even realized, surprised when he was already looking at the front gates of the school. Looking up at his classroom on the second floor, his smile quickly turned to a frown as the creature was standing on the other side. Joseph turned around to run away but stopped when he heard a loud smash as the sound of glass landed on the ground. He turned around and saw his peers looking out of a broken window, confused, an angry teacher beyond them. Joseph was shocked at the realization this creature could affect the real world. As the weekend started, Joseph had doubts if he should still be exploring this dream world. Despite his fears, however, he was still enthralled. At this point, he slept more than he was awake. He saw this monster more than once but managed to avoid it each time. This thing scared him, but it too was part of this dream world that fascinated him. He found it could change its shape, sometimes looking more human, more like a child. Other times it looked completely inhuman, like a dark beast. He always watched from a distance and ran away when it noticed him. If he was cornered, Joseph found he could force himself awake. He was addicted to the dream world. His overworked mother failed to notice, and his teenage sister was too wrapped up in her own life to notice her oversleeping little brother. It was a cold night. Joseph was busy playing in the snowy streets when he noticed the creature once again. This time, it was looking right at him, standing in front of his house. It turned and walked through his front door. Panicked, Joseph thought it was going after his mother or sister and ran after it. He quickly checked his mother's room, but no sign of the creature. Then he looked in on his sister, but still not there. Joseph felt relieved for a moment before remembering that he still had his own body, sleeping soundly in his own bed. 
Rushing into his own room, he saw the creature sitting on the floor, looking like a human child without a face. The soft glow was next to him on the corner of Joseph's bed. A smile formed on the creature where there was no mouth before. On the floor next to his hand was Joseph's mother's lighter. Joseph could feel the warmth in his feet and saw the glow for what it was. Fire. He immediately tried to wake up, but he couldn't. The oil-like child got up off the floor and, walking right through the wall, Joseph could not see it, but the newly formed mouth never left the shape of a smile. In a matter of moments, the fire spread over the old mattress. Joseph could feel the flames, he felt the burns, and he screamed in agony, but it made no sound. He ran to his mother's side, trying desperately to wake her. All of his words were without sound, though, and she slept soundly as her son burned to death. The neighborhood was awake that night, watching firemen come into and out of their neighbor's house. A teenager and middle-aged woman were saved thanks to smoke detectors, but the firefighters could do little for the boy whose room the fire started in. The firefighters had seen this sort of thing before, an unwatched child playing with fire and an old mattress. Yes, this was likely another case of the same. Unknown to everyone else, however, there was someone else watching. Joseph watched as he saw his mother and sister crying, begging for them to notice him. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. I bought the winning Mega Millions lottery ticket last week, but it hasn't been announced, and it never will be. And I need to tell you why. I bought it last Thursday from the gas station, five minutes from my house. I'm not usually a lottery person, but I figured with the jackpot being as high as it is, why not? It wasn't until I got home that I noticed it. The message. Underneath the Mega Millions logo was a message printed so lightly it was barely visible. Come alone. And below that, at a bit of an angle just as nearly readable, was a set of GPS coordinates. I looked up where those GPS coordinates led, and it was about a three-hour drive from my house. And apparently, empty field just past the state line. I did some searching around online, looking for similar instances as this one, people seeing messages on their lottery tickets, but found nothing. I was apprehensive to go, I think with good reason, but I was intrigued very much so. I had this piece of paper in my hand, one that had a 1 in almost 260 million chance of being worth upwards of a billion dollars. But not just that, this one also had something more to it. It may sound foolish to you, but the curiosity it had piqued was nigh impossible to ignore. I had off work that day and decided that I was going to drive that three hours. I knew it was a long shot. In fact, long shot is the wrong term. I was driving to somewhere I've never been a place there was apparently nothing but grass as far as the eye can see, for what was essentially no reason that was known to me. As I drove, the foolishness of the whole endeavor started to weigh on me. 
and I almost considered turning around. I looked at my GPS and realized I was already almost halfway there, so I said, screw it, and pressed on. The GPS took me down a long dirt road, but the destination was about a quarter mile into a field of tall grass and corn stalks. I parked the car and trekked the rest of the way on foot. I got as close to the exact latitude and longitudinal points as I could and found myself, as I'd imagined, standing in the middle of a big field with a stupid look on my face and feeling even stupider. All I could see in any direction was more grass, trees, a few corn stalks here and there, and blue sky. The crickets chirped and chirped and chirped. I stood there for a few minutes, looking around, waiting for something, someone, any, anyone, anything. But the wind just kept blowing, the crickets kept chirping. I yelled out, hello? No response. I'm here alone. No response. I was disappointed. I didn't know why, but I was disappointed. I had no idea what I was expecting, but whatever it was, it didn't happen. I took an exasperated breath and resolved to walk back to my car, get in, turn around, and drive the three hours back home thinking that I had come out here solely to stand in a field for ten minutes. Then I turned around. Standing behind me were four people in suits. Over those suits they wore ankle-length jackets with hoods that completely obscured their faces. They stood shoulder to shoulder, effectively blocking the path from whence I'd come. I just sort of stood there. I had no idea what to say. This certainly isn't what I was expecting, but then again the entire scenario was strange, so perhaps this wasn't all that unusual considering. Just as I was going to open my mouth to try to speak, one of them beat me to the punch. You have the ticket? I reached in my back pocket and retrieved my wallet, took out the ticket, and held it up. The two people on the inside of the line stepped back and to the side extending their arms as if to invite me to walk past, the invitation I hesitantly accepted. I took awkward steps toward them, towards them, towards them, up to them and started past them. Once I'd passed the cloaked people, they turned around and began to follow me. Every instinct I had told me to run, but each of my legs felt like they weighed a thousand pounds. I kept on the way I'd come in, but about halfway back I was met by two more people in suits and cloaks who then led me into an area covered in grass that was taller than me. The other four continued following closely behind, and it was them I was most unsure of. We walked for about three minutes through the tall grass until we met yet another two people in suits and cloaks standing in a small circular area where the grass had been laid flat. Those two then leaned over and each moved a sheet of the downed grass to the side, revealing a hatch door. It was then that I found my voice. Where does that go? I asked them, even though I felt like I didn't have a choice as to whether or not I'd be finding out regardless. To safety, someone said from behind me. That answer actually put me at relative ease and I still don't know why. I had no reason to think anything good was going to happen, but that assurance gave me a strange peace of mind. I walked up to the hatch and looked into it, finding a narrow staircase leading down to a landing with what looked to be an equally narrow hallway to the left. I looked over my shoulder and found the suited people slowly closing in behind me, not necessarily in a threatening way, so I started heading down the stairs. As I got about halfway down, some lights clicked on, which I was thankful for, as I'd expected to be in the dark once the sunlight was no longer an option. The door to the latch was closed behind me, and the four cloaked people that followed closely behind. Two of the cloaked people squeezed around the sides of me and led the way as we passed a number of doors. We finally reached the end of the hall and a set of double doors, 
one of the suited people removed a glove and placed their right hand on a scanner, and I heard a lock unclick. They opened the door and led me in, and I was met by a man in a red suit with a white hooded cloak. He looked to me and asked an odd question. Do you feel lucky? I didn't know how to respond, so I just kind of shrugged. How'd you feel when you bought the ticket? He asked. Uh, just sort of like I just bought a lottery ticket, I don't know. I was beyond nervous. The ticket you bought is a winner. The winner. Had you cashed it in, you would be wealthy beyond your wildest imagination. So why am I here? Why am I not cashing it? His crypticness was immediately aggravating. Wait, how do you even know that? The winning numbers haven't been drawn yet. Do you remember who won the last time? There was a substantial jackpot. Or the time before that? The man asked. Well, they're dead. Or missing, I suppose, officially. But they're dead. Again, I didn't know what to say. An 11-person office pool won this past July in California. But the true winner was a woman named Patricia Stevens. They made sure another ticket with the winning numbers was printed so they could take her. Before that, a trust in Ohio was named as the winner, but it was really a small nonprofit organization in Minnesota, which soon shut its doors without reason. About a month before that, a man named Richard Wall in New Jersey was the supposed winner. The person before him that got the same number as he did was Matthew Polis, who left his house to go claim his winnings and was never seen again just up and left his wife and newborn daughter. You were the first one we were able to get before the ticket was cashed and it was too late, before they replaced you with a new winner. Too late? Uh, hold on, what? I had no idea what was going on. T too late for what? Before they could get to you, he said, as if I was supposed to know what he was talking about. Who? What? What the hell are you talking about? I just wanted to know what was happening. Getting these bits and pieces was frustrating. The MUSL, Multi-State Lottery Association. They're doing things. They're taking the people that have won, the actual winners, and experimenting. They believe there is something about the human brain, the human mind, consciousness, that influences what we call luck. I stared at the man for a moment. That's ridiculous, I blurted out, not meaning to be rude, but it was ridiculous. I'm sure that's how it sounds. Perhaps I can show you. The man's tone changed from one of a hurried panic to a calm, relaxed one. He led me through another door, down another hallway, and into what looked to be a hospital room, only with markedly more computers, none of which were on, and some of which looked like they hadn't been touched in some time, others yet broken. What is this place down here? I asked. Not just of the room we were in, but the entire bunker. This is where we monitor them, he replied. The lottery people? Yes, as well as... He trailed off. This is where we do monitoring of our own. We have reason to believe that the MUSL somehow tracks who is going to win. They somehow guide people, influence them. We… Ow! I cut him off and reflexively grabbed my right elbow after feeling a tiny pinch. I looked behind me and didn't see anything, nor was there any blood. Are you okay? The man asked. Yeah, uh, sorry. I focused my attention back to him. I have something to show you that may shock you, but I feel it would be best for you to see it nonetheless. I agreed and followed the man out of the hospital-like room and farther down the hall, through another set of double doors, and to the right, where he unlocked a door much heavier than the rest had been. We walked into an almost pitch-black room that was near freezing. Watch your step, the man told me. Just as he did, I nearly lost my footing as we took a single step down. Morgue 3 lights, he said aloud to no one in particular. And with that, the lights came on 
and we were standing before a number of tables, each with the remains of human beings on them, but each also with a human brain connected to various wires that led to laptops on side tables. In here, too, the computers seemed very dated and worn. It was at this point that I became entirely overwhelmed by fear. Up until then, my experience had been strange but more confusing than anything. Now, I just saw myself as a test subject for these hooded strangers whose faces I had yet to see. I couldn't help but imagine them operating on me and taking me apart. It became a surreal nightmare. Before I could say anything, the man finally began explaining things. We have computer experts who are able to access the lottery systems. The numbers chosen are not random, as you've doubtlessly been led to believe. They are picked carefully, and the MUSL targets certain individuals, certain groups, and tracks their behaviors before and during their purchase of the winning tickets and subsequent wins. We believe you have been tracked, and we believe that if you would have waited until the numbers were drawn and later claimed your winnings, that shortly thereafter you would have been taken by them. We had our people put the message on the ticket, just as we have with previous winners. But as I said, you were the first to see it. My obvious question was, why wouldn't you do something other than put a message that no one thinks to look for and no one can really see? But I figured they had their reasons, and besides, I was too frozen in fear to say anything. These pieces here, he said as he walked further into the room, gesturing at the nearby remains. These are what they have left behind. They complete their research and move the victims' possessions and what's left of them into a clandestine storage facility, which we were fortunately able to gain access to. You're lucky we got to you before they did. The man in the red suit and white cloak, hood still over his head, obscuring his face in shadow, stood under the single light in the room and asked if I would join them. I still couldn't say anything, but I suddenly felt like someone was behind me. I took a quick glance over my shoulder and two more people in black suits and hooded cloaks stood in the hallway, their hands behind their backs standing at attention. I... I began, unsure of what to say. What do you want me for? We need you the two people behind me said in unison, seemingly a male and a female. Okay, what do you need me for? I asked. We need to know what they know, the man in the red suit said. These discarded remains have been helpful to be sure, but we need to do what they're doing, get the information they're getting. We want to monitor you as you claim your winnings and you could perhaps even lead us to where they do what they do. They wanted me to be bait, basically. I responded that I wasn't sure and the change in their mood was palpable. You are in a unique position. You could save lives, the man in the red suit began yelling. You can help the world and you aren't sure? Just as I was going to try to turn around and make an attempt at an escape, someone else brushed past me also wearing a black cloak. They approached the man in a red suit and whispered something in his ear, then lowered their head, turned around, and exited the way they'd come. I noticed that beneath their cloak they were wearing a lab coat. As soon as they had taken their leave, the mood changed yet again, and the feeling was so odd. Of course, we can't force you to do anything, young man, he said in a calmer tone than he'd even started with, You have your ticket, and you may choose to do with it what you wish. Please, allow us to escort you out. I didn't even have a chance to comprehend what was happening before I found myself being led down the corridors, past the operating room, past the large area, through the door with the palm scanning pad, down the original hallway, and up the stairs. As I exited the bunker, I found that all the people that I had seen in there had followed and then some. Once we were all outside, all of them with their hoods up, faces still hidden, the man in the red suit walked up to me, his head down. If I were you, I would tear up that ticket. Make no mistake, 
the winning numbers are on it. But what will follow, should you choose to make your claim, isn't worth any amount of money. This I guarantee. I said nothing in reply and instead turned around and sprinted back to my vehicle. I got in, pulled a quick U-turn, and sped away from there as fast as my car would take me. I looked in my rear view as I sped down the dirt road and saw a giant plume of smoke rising from where the bunker had been. I made it home, still more confused than anything. The night they drew the winning numbers, I found that I do indeed possess a winning ticket and that I had correctly chosen all five numbers, plus the Mega Ball and the Mega Plier. At first I couldn't believe my eyes and was hesitant to claim my winnings, but then something clicked in me. At the same time, I felt the urge to write this, to let the world know of what is ostensibly going on, but it sounds ridiculous, right? That's because it is. I'm going to be a billionaire. There's nothing I need to worry about. I was born lucky, I suppose. I could feel it running through my veins. It's an odd sensation. I really am just a very lucky person. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. I am a chronic sleep talker. Always have been. Everyone who's ever slept in the same house as me will tell you that. My parents, siblings, friends, and especially my exes. They're the ones who got an earful. It was something we'd laugh about in the morning because most of what I'd say would be incoherent or nonsensical. Some of my famous lines included, "'There's too many helicopters in the pool,' and my balloon's on the wrong foot. <laughs> it never bothered anyone around me. My friends and family pretty much just got a kick out of it. But one day at work, the subject of sleeping came up. My co-workers threw stories back and forth about some of their weirdest dreams. I chimed in with my sleep-talking antics. Everyone laughed as I rattled off some of the crazier stuff I've said while zonked. One of my co-workers, Bill, really busted a gut. After he finished hyperventilating, he told me that I should set up a voice recorder while I sleep so I can play it back at work every morning. Honestly, I didn't think it was a bad idea. That night, I downloaded a decent voice recording app on my phone and placed it on my nightstand before I went to bed. Being single and living alone, I had no way of knowing what I said in my sleep anymore, so I was looking forward to hearing what it would pick up. It would be a humorous way to start my otherwise dull mornings. For two months, I recorded a lot of great stuff. One night in particular, I kept screaming, almost as if I was running from something in my dream. But after a few minutes, I said, bad fridge. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing at that one. Neither could my co-workers when I showed them. Eventually, the app picked up something unsettling. Listening to the audio for any trace of funny banter I might find, I heard a loud bang. It sounded like a door being slammed shut with great force. Hearing that, my heart sank. I wondered if an intruder had made their way into my home. My house is a small cottage on the outskirts of town. 
I was able to get it at a great price due to its location and age. As such, some of its components are antiquated. I knew after hearing the recording that the only two doors sturdy enough to make that loud of a thud were that of the attic and the basement. Basements and attics have always freaked me out. Never liked to go near them as a kid, and I still don't as an adult. They kind of terrify me. The ones in my house even more so. Something about them being old made them all the more sinister. Despite my fear, I had to make sure no one was in the house. I got up out of bed and headed straight for the basement, as that was the door closest to my bedroom. I hesitantly opened the door and descended into my home's depths. I was nervous, but I was desperate for some peace of mind. The basement was empty. I quickly ran back up to the first floor and proceeded to journey upstairs. Once I reached the attic door, I froze. As much as basements make my skin crawl, I find attics to be far worse. Maybe it was because they were always a big unknown to me. I had only ever been in an attic once my whole life, and that was to help my dad unload some Christmas decorations. Even then, I was spooked. Because of my phobia, I installed a deadbolt on the door when I moved in. It sounds foolish, but hey, it helps me sleep at night. Looking at the door, I noticed that the deadbolt was still locked. An intruder could have gone in and then relocked it on their way out, but at least I knew they weren't in there anymore. This was my excuse not to go inside. I went back downstairs and put the noise out of my mind. Forgetting all about the loud bang, I continued to record at night in the hopes of catching more sleep talking. I did, but it wasn't of the hilarious, absurd variety. The night after I recorded the noise, the only thing I said the whole night was, where are you? I didn't pay it any mind, as I have said similar things in my sleep before. It wasn't until I heard the following night's recording that I became alarmed. I said the same thing, where are you? Only this time it was followed by a strange, static sound. This was odd, but I chalked it up to coincidence and a phone malfunction. I quickly discovered that neither of these things were to blame. Every night after, I got almost the exact same thing. I would ask, where are you? And then I'd get some sort of static interference. I couldn't explain it, and it left me rather frazzled. I showed my coworkers, but they weren't able to offer me any insight. I thought about not recording anymore, but not knowing would make me more uneasy. I wanted to get to the bottom of what was going on. And then one night, I caught something different. Listening to the audio intently, I heard two distinct things. During a two-minute stretch in the recording, there were footsteps in the background, almost as if someone was pacing. It was very faint, but it was most certainly there. The second thing I heard was me asking the same question, where are you? Only this time, I received a response. It was a low whisper, but I could make out what it said. I'm upstairs. Deeply unnerved by my findings, I set up the app again the next night. I also took the liberty of setting up two digital cameras, one in my room and one facing the attic door. After adjusting the light settings on each, I felt confident in my approach. I didn't have time to deal with this crap, so I wanted nothing more than to get it sorted out somehow. Unfortunately for me, it just wasn't that simple. I slept through the night, like normal, but I did have a weird dream. In my dream, I was at home. I was sitting on my couch watching TV when I heard a scratching sound coming from upstairs. Naturally, I assumed it was mice, but as I sat there, the noise grew louder and louder it eventually morphed into a horrendous knocking sound. That's when I got up to investigate. I made my way up to the attic door and the noises ceased. I stood there for a moment, expecting it to start up again, but it didn't. 
complete silence for what felt like a few minutes. Then, without warning, a loud clicking sound broke the tension. The deadbolt had unlocked itself, and that's when I woke up to the sound of my alarm going off. I immediately got up and gathered the cameras as well as my phone. I was eager to see if they had captured anything. They did. But it only left me with more questions. Halfway through the audio on both my phone and the camera in my room, I heard once again, where are you? There was no response and no static, but there was a loud bang, just like the one I'd caught before, only more distinct. It was most certainly a door being slammed shut. I quickly grabbed the second camera and began looking through the footage. The attic door never opened. Instead, I heard the bang in the background ever so faintly. Given the volume in each of the clips, it seemed as though it might have been the basement door. After skimming through the rest of the footage and finding nothing else out of the ordinary, I decided to check the basement again. With a mixture of nerves and adrenaline, I ran over to the basement door and swung it open. I hurried downstairs and turned the light on. I was fed up and a little annoyed, thinking someone was somehow having a laugh at my expense. However, when the room lit up, I was greeted with the familiar sight of an unfurnished basement. It was completely empty. No intruder and no answers. Frustrated, I went off to work and tried to keep my mind off of my dilemma. That proved to be a difficult task. I kept playing out different scenarios in my head during the workday, but nothing made sense. The only logical, though somewhat illogical, explanation that I could come up with was that I was being harassed by a spirit. I didn't want to give in to that notion, but I was running out of ideas. I tried to talk with my co-workers again in the hopes that they would tell me it was nothing to worry about. Instead, I received the opposite. One of my co-workers told me to call the cops and have them look through the house for signs of a break-in. Another told me I should stay at a friend's house. Bill told me to abandon the house and run for the hills. He was only joking, but it didn't make me feel any better about the matter. <sighs> Things took a turn for the bizarre when I arrived home that day. Opening the front door to the cottage, I stepped in and set my jacket down on the couch. I then plopped down in an attempt to unwind. Immediately after sitting, I heard the bang again. It was clear as day. It was the same sound from the audio and the footage, but this time I was hearing it in person. I jumped up and looked straight ahead at the basement door. You could see it from the couch. It had been in my line of sight the entire time. Though I hadn't been looking directly at it, I was fairly certain it hadn't moved. Still, the bang definitely came from that direction. Spooked but curious, I decided to check it out. I walked over cautiously and examined the door. There was no indication that it had been slammed shut. The wood around the door was pristine and the floor below had not been scraped. I opened it and trotted down the old creaky stairs to investigate the basement for a third time. After reaching the bottom, I turned the light on. I expected to see nothing, just as I had before. While scanning the room left to right, nothing is mostly what I saw. After doing a double take, however, I realized that something was amiss. Off in the center of the far wall was a door. This sent a chill up my spine. My basement had no other doors. That I was sure of. I knew this before purchasing the place almost a year ago, when I first took the grand tour. I also didn't see the door when I went down there that morning or the other day. It didn't make a lick of sense. I walked towards it, bewildered. I wasn't sure of the door's origins, but I knew that it had to be the cause of the sounds I'd been hearing. There was no other explanation. As I approached the impossibility before me, I realized something that made my skin crawl. I recognized the wood, the design, and the deadbolt. It was the attic door. I didn't want to open it for fear of what might be lurking behind. 
Instead, I ran upstairs and checked to see if the attic door was still there, the actual one. It was, indeed. I then ran back downstairs into the basement, only to find that the door down there had vanished. Had I merely imagined its presence? Thinking I had gone completely mad, I went back upstairs and sat down on the couch. My mind was running haywire, trying to comprehend things, but it eventually gave in to its own weariness. I ended up taking a short nap, and that's when I had another weird dream. This dream was similar to the one I had before. I was sitting on the couch, watching TV, when I heard a scratching noise. The only difference was it was coming from the basement rather than the attic. It, too, progressed and turned into a voracious knocking that I couldn't ignore. As such, I got up from the couch and went downstairs to put a stop to it. In my dream, the basement was empty, no mysterious door in sight. That and the knocking and scratching ceased upon my entrance. At my wit's end, I went back upstairs. The sound then returned with a vengeance, only this time it was coming from the attic again. I ran up there as fast as I could, but the noise stopped. I waited. Following the narrative of my previous dream, the deadbolt clicked, signaling that the door had unlocked itself. Unlike my previous dream, however, the door opened up a bit, and a hand reached out from within. That's when I woke up. I wrote the first dream off as the byproduct of an overstressed mind, but to have it reoccur? That wasn't ordinary, at least not for me. Between the door in my basement and my strange nightmares, I was a mess. Both perplexed and frightened, I called my friend John. John is an eccentric fellow. He's the kind of guy who believes in UFOs, ghosts, conspiracy theories, the occult, and other things of that nature. Not only does he believe in them, but he studies them. He knows more about Roswell than I do about myself. Being a skeptic, I always thought the massive amount of information he retained was borderline useless. I changed my mind about that after seeing my attic door pop up in my basement. If anyone could help, or at least steer me in the right direction, it was him. I spoke with John for a couple of hours. He was ecstatic after hearing about my experience. He began rattling off all the different things he thought it might indicate. Some of his theories included a wormhole, a gateway to the other side, uh, and even a glitch. One of the many theories that he subscribes to is that the world we live in is a simulation. He told me that he couldn't be completely certain about what it was without seeing it for himself. Unfortunately, he lives too far away to just stop by and visit. Instead of leaving me empty-handed, John gave me some advice on what to do next. After telling him about the voice I captured and the dreams I'd been having, he started leaning towards the ghost idea. He thought it might be trying to communicate with me. Because of this, he told me I should set up the voice recorder in the basement and ask the spirit some questions. I could play back the recording after and listen for the voice. John said that I should do it in the attic as well. Though weary of his methods, I told him I'd try it out. After all, I couldn't just sit around and expect the situation to resolve itself. I didn't like the idea of going up into the attic by myself, but I needed to do something. After getting off the phone, I immediately put his plan into action. The basement would have to be first, as I was still apprehensive about going upstairs. I set up the app and put my phone on the basement floor. I proceeded to ask questions leaving enough space in between for someone or something to answer. I asked for normal things like its name, its age, and what it wanted. After roughly five minutes of interrogation, I stopped the recording and played it back. I must have listened to my own voice a million times, hoping for anything audible to present itself. To my dismay, I caught nothing of the sort. It seemed as though the attic would indeed have to be my next venture. I reluctantly climbed the stairs up to the attic door. I looked at it for a few moments, took a deep breath, 
and unlocked the deadbolt. I opened the door and braced myself. There was nothing there, save for the previous owner's belongings. When I first purchased the house, I had to do a little bit of renovating, so to speak. The owner before me had no cable, electricity, or proper plumbing. On top of that, they left all of their stuff behind. I had most of it removed, but left everything that was in the attic. I had no need for the space, and I didn't want to put any more money into emptying the house than I had to. I perused through the attic's wares for a bit, curious as to what it was that I technically owned. Some of the interesting items that stood out to me were an old postcard from Paris, a strange-looking dog collar, and a book on witchcraft. The fear set in while going through the contents of my new collection. The angled ceiling, antiques, and large window overlooking my yard did give the place a dose of charm, but I still didn't like attics. I quickly hit the record button on the app and set my phone on the floor. I asked the same questions as before, but didn't leave as much space in between as I really wanted to get the hell out of there. Before stopping the recording, I had a thought. Perhaps the spirit would respond if I asked it the same question that I did in my sleep. I cleared my throat and asked, where are you? After asking the final question, I stopped the recording and played it back. It sounded almost identical to the one I had recorded in the basement, complete with a lack of answers. That is until the very end. After I asked the last question, I heard a familiar low whisper. Behind you. After hearing this reply, I immediately turned around. There was nothing there. Despite this, I hightailed it downstairs. That eerie voice reinforced my phobia of addicts and instilled in me an indescribable dread. I could no longer bear to be in that house by myself. I called John again and begged him to help me out. I told him I'd give him the gas money for the eight-hour round trip. He was reluctant at first, knowing that he'd have to spend the night and call out from work the next morning. Curiosity got the best of him in the end. After much deliberation, he agreed to come over. I waited for John in my car. While sitting there, I couldn't help but examine my house. I began asking myself questions like, is it really haunted? Do ghosts really exist? And my favorite, is this what my life has come to? Though the questions were speculative and rhetorical, I pretty much knew the answers. As I gazed towards the house in disappointment, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. It was a silhouette, standing at the attic window. Holy crap, what the what do I do? Those were the only retorts that crossed my mind after seeing the shadowy figure. After a few moments of staring, the figure stepped back from the window completely out of sight. I sat and pondered about it for a few minutes after its departure. In a moment of bravery, I chose to go back in the house and up to the attic. Crazy, I know, but it's my house, and I needed to show this thing that I wasn't interested in playing its games even if I was scared to death. Besides, John would have had my head if I didn't follow the damn thing. Feeling confident but still shaky, I ventured up into the attic. I swung the door open without hesitation and waltzed in like I owned the place. After all, I did. The attic was void of any ghostly figures, but it did harbor the faint scent of candle wax unsure of how to proceed, I started talking in a loud and firm tone. This isn't your house. I'm tired of your games, spirit. I demand that you leave at once. I knew this wasn't going to work, but it was almost cathartic. I felt a heck of a lot better fighting back. I walked around the attic, satisfied with my rant, thinking that I had actually conquered my fear. My smug demeanor wouldn't last, though, more than a few moments. Soon after I spoke, a gust of wind blew through the attic and hit me like a bus, nearly knocked me over. I knew it was the ghosts doing. I tried to stand my ground, but I was pretty damn frightened. 
I watched as everything around me flew about, creating a tornado of mementos and keepsakes. I was about to retreat when I noticed something that hadn't budged an inch. It was the book on witchcraft that I had seen before. Upon noticing it, the wind inexplicably stopped and everything fell to the floor. I walked over to the book, curious as to why it remained stationary. As I did, it opened up on its own. It was startling, but I somehow sensed no malice. I was coming around to the fact that the ghost might really be trying to communicate with me. The page the book landed on was a spell. The whole thing was in Latin, but from what I could make out it had something to do with growing plants. Confused, I reached out to the ghost for help. What do you want me to do? After asking the question, the attic door slammed shut. I thought for a moment and gathered that it wanted me to recite the spell in the attic. I was still confused, but somehow calm. It felt as though I was helping the spirit in some way. Before I could read from the book, my phone went off. It was a text from John. So, so sorry, I can't make it out there. My boss won't give me the day off tomorrow and I'm not sure my car will make it there and back. It desperately needs new tires and I won't be able to buy those until Friday. Give me a call back then and I'll see what I can do. Good luck. Crap. Even though I wasn't freaking out anymore, it was nice knowing that someone was on their way to my house, just in case things went sour. I didn't like it, but I was on my own. I accepted this and turned my attention back to the book. It was time to deliver the spell. I cleared my throat and began reciting the text in the book. I took Latin in college, and although I didn't retain all the information, I knew enough to make the proper pronunciations. Even still, I stumbled over my words during certain parts. Because of this, I had to restart a couple of times. I wanted to get it right, especially if it was truly what the ghost wanted. After finishing the spell flawlessly, for the most part, the attic door opened. I walked out with the book in hand, wondering if everything was over. When I reached the bottom step and turned around the corner, it became quickly apparent that it wasn't. The basement door was wide open. I was in uncharted territory, taking orders from a ghost, but I hoped I was following along all right. Seeing the basement door ajar convinced me that I probably needed to recite the spell down there as well. I still wasn't sure why, but it felt like this was the spirit's will. As such, I obliged. I walked down into the basement with the book and turned the light on. A quick glance around revealed that I was alone and that there was no door. I cleared my throat once again and began reciting the spell, word for word. Honestly, I was a little excited. I felt like I was doing something productive about my ghost problem and that it might actually help put it to rest. This time, I got it right on the first try. Upon finishing the spell in the basement, the house began shaking. When I say the house, I mean the whole house, basement and all. I'd never experienced an earthquake before, but it seemed like the only logical explanation for what was happening. It wasn't until I looked around the room during the madness that I realized it was the spells doing. There on the far wall, shaking with the rest of the house, was the attic door. I wondered if the spell had somehow summoned it, simultaneously causing the house to wobble. The tremor eventually stopped and I was left with the door, lending credence to my theory. I waited for a few minutes, thinking the door would open, but it did not. It seemed that I would have to do that myself. I wasn't too happy about it, but I'd come too far to back out now. I gathered my wits and walked over to the door. I proceeded to swing it open without fear, just as I had upstairs. Behind the door was a surprise. It was the attic. The attic upstairs. Everything was the same, only there was a man standing at the window. Hearing me open the door, he turned around. His eyes widened when he saw me. He ran so fast in my direction that I, I didn't even have time to take more than a single step back. 
He rushed through the doorway and into the basement. He turned back around and slammed the attic door shut, making sure to lock the deadbolt. He turned to me, grabbed my shoulders, and looked me dead in the eye. I was baffled and scared for my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. After expressing his thanks, the man let go of me and ran upstairs, but not before turning back around and offering me some advice. Whatever you do, don't go in there. He gestured toward the attic door before bolting upstairs. I ran after him, wanting to ask some questions, but when I got upstairs, it was already too late. My front door was open and I could see him running down the dirt road towards town. And that was that. I have slept every night since then with no noises or paranormal issues whatsoever. I even set up the cameras and voice recorder a few times to make sure they didn't catch a damn thing. I don't know what the heck happened, but I'm sure of one thing. The man that came out from behind that attic door was no ghost. It was a living, breathing person. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.